All right, I think it's time. Welcome back. I hope you all had a nice little break. Uh, so our next test is on Friday. I thought we should start with a little uh, review or something about, uh, I'll just t tell you what's on the test. Um, the test shall cover everything that we've done since the first exam, so I'm not going to ask you specifically to do old things, although there are some things you, you will still want to be able to do, but um, these are, as far as I can tell, the topics that we should expect to see on the test. So we begin with regular expressions. The first test came kind of in the middle when we were talking about that. So specifically, we um, the last thing that we did about regular expressions was regular expressions and sort of interoperating with NFAs. So that is to say, I could give you a regular expression and say, show me a, an equivalent NFA. Or it could be the other way around. I give you an NFA. You make me a regular expression that expresses the same language. All right. Actually, the second thing that I just said is harder. So this, the regular expression converting to NFA is easier. That's the thing where, like, if you see a plus, that makes two branching pathways. If you see a star, that makes this kind of burger-shaped um, loop type thing. And if you see uh, concatenations, then that you stick these things uh, one after another. Um, look that up in your notes if you like. That, in my opinion, is fairly straightforward. If you, you just have to remember how to do it. The other way around, if I give you an NFA and say, show me a regular expression, that's a bit harder. You have to look for all of the loops that you can find and express those loops as stars of things. You'll see we did some examples like that. That is, in my opinion, slightly harder. OK, that was, so that, that's it for regular expressions on this test. Next, we started talking about derivatives. This was a big thing that we talked about for a while. The basic thing that you should be able to do is like, you know, find derivatives of a set. I might just give you a set and say, tell me what is the derivative with respect to a, b of this thing. Or the most, the, the most sort of typical type, derivative type question is, Show <coughs> L is non-regular. That's really the whole the point of talking about derivatives at all as far as this class goes is you can use derivatives to show that a language is not regular. Those are like two separate things. That of course involves finding the derivatives of various sets. All right. Next we talked about grammars. Grandmas. Um, there are, so I could just sort of give you a grammar and ask you to um, say what the language is. The language generated by some grammar. I could go the other way around. Give me a grammar that generates some language. Give a grammar to generate some L, right? Like, give me a grammar for A to the N, B to the N, that kind of thing. This involves several little, like, tactics. There were things about how do you manage balancing. That's if you see some, some kind of repeated exponent. You need to balance certain things. So th those can be a little tricky sometimes. All right. And then, what else? Oh, part of this, give a grammar to generate some language. Part of that was there was a specific procedure to go NFA to a grammar. So you should, this is an easy process, but one that you might have forgotten since then. So check it out. Anybody want to say, is there a procedure to go generally from a grammar back to an NFA? The answer is no, and there's a good reason for that. Anybody? Anybody know why can you not actually there is it's not possible to have a procedure that converts any grammar into an NFA. I should have saved this. This would have been a nice test question that you would all get wrong. Some grammars are not like 
Yeah, that's right. Some grammars make non-regular languages, and that means those grammars could never be converted to an NFA because an NFA cannot represent a non-regular language. Yeah, great. So you can go NFA to grammar. That's easy. You cannot, in general, go the other way, except in special cases. And, OK, what else? Um, oh, and you should just, this is something that is very simple, but I find oftentimes people forget. Um, you should know what a context-free grammar is. Context-free, remember, means every, every one of those arrows, the left side of the arrow is just a single non-terminal letter. That's called a context-free grammar. There's not much else to say about what a context-free grammar is, but uh, just don't forget what that actually means. All right, this is all I could think of in terms of grammars. And then we had stack machines as our latest topic. And you should be able to say, make a stack machine for a particular language. This, in my opinion, is very hard, actually. So I would, um, well, make a stack machine for some language. You could also go the other way around. I show you a stack machine and ask you to describe to me what, what the language is of this stack machine. So say the language of some stack machine. And then the very last thing that we talked about, like last time we met, one week ago, was uh, converting stack machine back and forth to context-free grammar. And there are two different procedures. So there's one, both are easy to do. You just have to remember how to do them. But there's one procedure to take a stack machine and convert to a grammar. And then there's another procedure that takes a grammar and converts it into a stack machine. And those two procedures are quite different from one another, but they're both easy to do. You just have to remember how to do them. And this is, in my opinion, the best way to answer questions of this type. If I ask you to make a stack machine for some language, to me, the easiest way to do that is to make a grammar and then convert to a stack machine because I find it much easier to think in terms of creating grammars than creating a stack machine. So I would say this question on its own can be quite difficult, but if you know how to interoperate stack machines and grammars, then it's not so hard. Just make a grammar and convert to a stack machine. And this is all that I could think of to put on the test. Anybody feel like I left something out? Either mention it now or don't mention it. Yeah? Yeah, so um, as part of this sort of, yeah, I would consider that sort of a, an easier version of a question like this. If I, I show you a grammar, I could say, show me a specific derivation of this string AAB or whatever. Yeah, and similarly on the stack machine, I could say something like, here's a stack machine, show me that this string is accepted, or show me that this string is rejected. Yeah, those, in my opinion, tend to be fairly straightforward. All right, D would anybody, uh, I don't have like a little review session plan for this stuff, but um, my plan was to just go on with the, uh, you know, go on with the rest of the course for the rest of today. What we do for the rest of today will not be on the test. The, would anybody really like to do examples of any one of these? Any, anything you feel like we should try? I'm happy to try and make up examples if you like, or else we'll just go on. All right, let's just go on then. So these are the topics, as far as I'm concerned, for the test. I would be happy to get together with anybody um, you know, over the next few days if you want to chat about anything in particular. I would be happy to. By the way, there's no homework due tonight. Um, I thought that since we only had one day of class last week, I thought we'd just roll that into the next, next time. But then I remembered that we have a test. Uh, so maybe it would be nice to put the last bit of stuff on homework before having the test about it. But it's too late now. I don't I want to make a homework assignment that's due today. Really, the only last stuff that we did was this, this part, right? And this just consists of two different sort of rules that you have to remember. There's really, it's, uh, as far as I can tell, it's not hard to do those kinds of problems. You just have to remember the procedure. 
But uh, I would be happy to chat with anybody about that or anything else. All right. All right. Let's move on then. So we're actually done talking about stack machines. I didn't have anything more to say about stack machines. So we are going to move on to our last topic for the semester. My favorite part of the course, actually. The Turing machine. Turing machines. This is our last type of machine that we're going to talk about. And the most, uh, most sophisticated type of machine that we uh, have done in the course. And I would say, I'm not sure, um, well, you, you can decide for yourself if you agree with me or not. In my opinion, Turing machines, in terms of like just being a student in this class, I think that this is the hardest part of the class, what we're going to do from now to the end. So that's my little heads up. I have often felt, I don't know if any of you felt this way, I often have felt like the beginning of this class when I teach it is too easy and the end is too hard. I don't know if any of you felt like this class is too easy so far. Sometimes I feel that way, I don't know. Um, but uh, Turing machines are much more complicated and like more sophisticated than the other types of machines that we've been doing so far. So that's a little something, something to look forward to, I guess, or be aware of. All right, Turing machines. Maybe I'll give you a little, a refresh your memory a little bit on the history of this thing. So I, I mentioned a little bit about Turing and the history of this on the first day of class. I don't know if you remember any of that stuff, but I will just refresh your memory just a little bit. So this all comes back, uh, th this all sort of came around in the early 1900s, like around the beginning of the century um, and around there. Uh, everybody at that time was talking about axioms were in style in mathematics. All right, axioms. That is the kind of golden ideal of mathematics for, for a very long time has been the way you do mathematics is by starting with fundamental axioms that you just say up front, this is, this is what I'm going to assume is true about the universe. And then based on those fundamental axioms, you prove more complicated theorems. And this was the approach that was, I don't know if it was invented, but most famously done by Euclid in geometry. These were axioms about right angles and things like that, which you may be familiar with. These axioms kind of went out of style for a long time, but then around this time, the beginning of the 20th century, axioms sort of came back into style. And if you, um, you math majors who've taken our other kind of 300 level classes have been exposed to this viewpoint. So for instance, like in the 1880s, the definition of uh, group and vector space, these using axioms in algebra. So for a long time, axioms were not used in, uh, in algebra or in analysis, but this, uh, this came back into style at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the 1890s, this guy named Hilbert came up with axioms for geometry, which we sometimes call Hilbert's geometry axioms. which is basically uh, in, um, inspired by Euclid's geometry, which was done like thousands of years ago, the ancient Greeks. But um, since that time, we have come to realize that there were some mistakes in Euclid's uh, geometry work, and also some things which you might not call mistakes, but were kind of oversights, things that Euclid didn't really think about that he probably should have thought about. Uh, and Hilbert kind of cleaned all that stuff up with this Hilbert's geometry axioms. And then in the 1900s, like the, the 1900s, whatever that decade is called, um, axioms for set theory. And there is, a, there is a standard set theory that basically all of mathematics uses today, which goes back to fundamental axioms for set theory, uh, specifically it is referred to as ZFC, if you want to sound fancy. Um, 
This stands for the zermelo frankel axioms with the axiom of choice. That's what the C stands for. But this is the standard type of set theory that all mathematicians, basically all mathematicians use, um, was defined in terms of axioms. And all of mathematics was being rephrased in terms of axioms. It happened in analysis also. Um, anyway, big question came up. And this was a question specifically asked by Hilbert. Um, if you choose some axioms for whatever you happen to be talking about, for geometry or for algebra, or even just maybe, maybe you could have just basic axioms for all of mathematics. That would be like the set theory axioms, which is sort of a general uh, context in which to do any mathematics. Anyway, um, if we choose axioms, is there some kind of sort of, um, this is not what I meant to say. Can I, can I rewrite the beginning of the sentence? If we choose axioms and ask some, sorry about this. And ask some yes or no question. then is there always a way to answer the question yes or no and prove the answer based on the axioms? If we choose some axioms, say for geometry or something, and then ask some yes or no question, like is there such a thing as a triangle that has this or that property? You feel like, well, you should be able to figure that out. I mean, maybe you don't, maybe you're not smart enough to figure it out, but there, in principle, there should be some way to figure it out. This is the question that Hilbert was asking. If we choose axioms and ask some yes or no question, um, is there always a provable yes or no answer? By provable, I mean from the axioms. All right. This is kind of the point of axioms. The whole idea is that you choose axioms, and the reason you have the axioms is so that you can prove or decide the answer to any questions that you might want to ask about those axioms, all right? So if we choose some axioms and ask some yes or no question, then is there always a provable yes or no answer using the axioms? If I feel like the answer to this should probably be yes. That's kind of the purpose of, the, of axioms, um, that you use the axioms to answer any mathematical questions that you might want to ask. Here's another sort of follow-up question. If so, is there some kind of master procedure for proving things based on axioms? And this is a, a bit of a deeper question. Is there some master procedure for proving things based on axioms? What I mean by that is if you believe that any mathematical question can in principle be answered yes or no by just sort of recombining the axioms in some way, this would su suggest that, you know, it, there's only like finitely many axioms typically. If, like if you're doing algebra in a group, there are five axioms, right? So this means in theory, any theorem about groups can be proved using only these five axioms. And you might wonder like, could I not, couldn't I just sort of Maybe there's some kind of master procedure for recombining the axioms in various orders to generate all possible theorems about groups, all right? This is a question that, that was being asked at the time. Is there some master procedure for which we could, in theory, use to prove anything in mathematics? Um, another, a more modern way of asking this question is, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, if all of geometry, for example, can be expressed in five axioms, couldn't you just feed those into a computer and ask the computer to just recombine the axioms in all possible ways? And the computer would just create every possible theorem in geometry? Um, would that actually work? Like that's basically this, this question that's being asked here. Can there be some kind of master procedure for proving things based on axioms? Or is it the case that no matter what axioms you choose, there will always somehow be a theorem which cannot be proven just using the axioms in some combination? I don't know if that would even make sense. But anyway, these are all the questions that were being asked in the general mathematical world at this time. And this is the question that Turing 
wanted to address turned Turing address these questions and the answer is basically no that is to say it's it's sort of no to both of these the first question that I asked here was if we choose the axioms and ask some yes or no question is there always a provable yes or no answer I don't know if you've ever if anyone if you've ever heard that this is a true fact about mathematics the answer to this question is no that means um, if you choose some axioms in fact there will always be some questions which are unprovable based on the axioms. Uh, for example, in group theory, there are five axioms for defining groups, and every theorem about groups can be proven using the axioms, but there's some theorems about group, groups which cannot be proven and also cannot be disproven using the axioms. This, is, this should seem deeply strange if you're, if, you're even, if you're still paying attention at this point. It means that some, some uh, mathematical questions simply cannot be answered yes or no. Um, based on axioms. S strange but true. And then the, the second question also, is there some master procedure for proving things based on axioms? Another way to ask that is, it, is it possible for to create a computer that kind of just generates all possible theorems by combining the axioms in some way? And uh, the answer to this is also uh, sort of no, because there are some theorems which even though you can write, you can ask the question, actually that it has no yes or no answer that's provable based on axioms. Very, uh, very strange. Um, these were Turing's uh, contribution. But anyway, the big question, sort of a, a preliminary question that Turing asked is, what exactly is a procedure? That second question I asked was, is there some master procedure for whatever? You have, to, you have to be particular about saying what exactly counts as a procedure. Uh, and this question was actually answered by Turing in a, in a particular way, and it was answered by other people in, in other ways. And I, I thought I'd just mention this other guy named Alonzo Church who lived at the same time as Turing and was very much interested in exactly the same questions, came up with a solution which is completely different from Turing's. So Alonzo Church's idea was he defined sort of, this is kind of like using axioms to answer the question. He defined a small collection of very simple functions, like pure abstract mathematical functions in set theory, called, and, and he called these things lambda terms. That's the Greek letter lambda. And Church said any procedure that you can imagine should be expressible in terms of my very simple lambda terms. And that's what counts as a procedure. It's any, any kind of function which can be expressible using these very basic ingredients. This is kind of a similar idea to using axioms uh, in the first place. Very simple function called lambda terms. And then Church's idea was a procedure, a procedure is any uh, combination of lambda terms. Right, and this actually, when we say Turing did so much important work, Church's work is actually kind of equivalent to Turing. They did it totally separately, but they both answered the same questions, and they were both correct. Uh, but Turing's, the difference really is the idea. Turing's idea was much more influential than Church's idea, which is why basically nobody has heard of lambda terms, but we have all heard of Turing machines, and we all sort of like, in your pocket right now is something like a Turing machine, but in your other pocket is not a lambda term, because those are just, they were too weird and abstract to catch on, sort of culturally speaking, although they were the same. Anyway, Turing's idea, we will finally get down to it, is a procedure 
is something we can do on a machine. And uh, it, Turing was furthermore very specific about the capabilities of this machine. Because you have to describe this specifically in mathematics. If you say this, then immediately you ask, OK, well, what counts as a machine? But Turing actually said specifically what counts as a machine. Um, and this is what kind of began the whole program of the 20th century for building uh, computing machines uh, of the type that we all have today. It was really based on this idea, even though the, mathematically Turing was doing the same thing as Church, but he packaged it in a much better sort of more stylish, cooler idea that, that was more obviously useful to people than uh, lambda terms, all right? So anyway, this is, this is, the, um, this is the, the history. I hope you have enjoyed this brief recap of the history of the subject. Turing's machine, um, it's a strange fact. This is a, this is a true fact. Turing's machine is much more complicated than NFAs, DFAs, or stack machines, but actually Turing's machine was created first. The, it was the first uh, abstract machine that, that anybody ever thought of. NFAs and DFAs were created later as a like baby version of a Turing machine. Um, of course, when people are learning it today, they do the baby version first and then the harder one, but uh, that's not the way it happened, historically speaking. Anyway, let's talk about what uh, the Turing machine is. So uh, Turing didn't call this a Turing machine. He referred to it as the universal machine. And the big idea behind the Turing machine is that it is a machine without a particular purpose or without a specific task. Because, of course, there were machines, sophisticated, even mathematical machines at the time for adding and multiplying numbers or whatever. Um, but they were purpose-made machines with specific functionality to them. But the whole point of Turing's machine is that it doesn't have a specific functionality. It is a machine which, in principle, can be used to do anything. And that's what, that's what makes it important as an idea. So the Turing machine, anyway, uh, how it's set up, it's similar to an NFA and DFA. So it has finitely many states. And actually, when we work with them, like in specific examples, we're going to draw little you know, circles and arrows to represent the states, much like an NFA, DFA. It has finitely many states. But it also has a memory which is, I suppose, kind of like a stack machine, but it's not organized like a stack. So it, a stack, you can only see the thing on the top, and this is not like that. It has finally many states plus memory organized on a tape. This is what Turing called it, a tape. And the tape is a big thing, sort of, that you imagine looks like this. And it, it's just a long tape, not a sticky tape, like a cassette tape or something. Um, a long tape. And on the tape, it has spots on it. And um, along the tape are written letters from the alphabet. So there's like a, you know, it, it says something like this on the tape. All right. This is what the tape looks like. And the other things on the tape are blank. Most of them are blank, but you can, as the machine is going, it can uh, put stuff on the tape, just like a stack machine carries a stack with it from time to time. All right? Um, just for the sake of uh, doing examples, it will be clear, uh, convenient to write a specific symbol for blanks. So uh, we are now and forever going to write capital B means blank. All right, so this capital B is blank. But we're going to end up talking a lot about blanks, so it's helpful to have a label for it, all right? And the tape is accessed. The tape, like I said, is, doesn't work like a stack. It is accessed by something which Turing called the head. And I'm going to indicate the head by putting like a little, a little hat at one spot. So that thing right there, this is the head. And in each step of the calculation, 
the state can change from one state to another, and also the head can move back and forth along the tape. So the head is allowed to only look at one spot on the tape at a time. So in that way, it's kind of like a stack, but the head doesn't have to be on the top all the time. The head can move back and forth along the tape. So I will say in each step, the head reads the symbol that it's looking at, which might be a blank or it might be one of the letters from the alphabet. The head reads the symbol on the tape where it is. It can only, the head only exists in like one location at a time. But anyway, in each step, the head reads the symbol on the tape. And then based on that symbol and based on the state, based on the symbol <coughs> and the state, the head, the head can change what's on the tape. So the head is, is somehow capable of modifying the symbol that it's looking at. Like right now the head is looking at an A, but based on the diagram of states and the arrows or whatever, maybe in this step the head will change this A to a B, or it could even change it to a blank. So based on the symbol and the state, the head can uh, write a new symbol or it can leave it the same if it wants to. The head can write a new symbol. And the head, after writing a new symbol, moves to the right or to the left by one position. Moves one position. Uh, right or left. And I'm going to use capital R or capital L for right or left moves. This is Turing's machine. And it sounds kind of ridiculous. I mean, we all know how this worked out. Like, this is a basic idea, which, which it's not an exaggeration to say, completely changed the world within the next 100 years. But uh, I'm sure at the time, this, uh, this is a total like left field, absurd kind of idea to bring into mathematics um, when nothing like this had ever been talked about before. But Turing was like, yeah, I think any mathematical procedure actually is equivalent to doing on a machine. And people said, oh, what, what machine do you mean? And he's like, oh, well, let's imagine there's an infinitely long tape and a little thing that moves back and forth along this tape, and it can modify each spot. This is a, this is, my, my initial reaction to this, I think back in the day would have been, what are you talking about? Like, this is a crazy thing that n nothing like this had, had existed before in the world of mathematics. But this is um, an uncommonly good idea. I mean, this is undoubtedly one of the most important ideas of the 20th century. Um, not just in mathematics, I mean in like human society in general. All right. So anyway, this is how the Turing machine works. In each step, the head reads the symbol on the tape, and based on that symbol, and also based on the state it's in, the head can write a new symbol, and it moves one position to the right or to the left. This is how the Turing machine works. And just, I'll say a little technicality here. Um, just like on our other machines, the string, um, a string can be either accepted or rejected. So to sort of test a string and see if it's accepted or rejected, we begin with the string on the tape and the head pointed at its first letter. So if you want to know like is ABA accepted, you put ABA on the tape with surrounded by blanks forever in, in either direction. The head points at the first letter which is would be A in that example. And then the head pointed at its first letter and do the steps according to the diagram, which we'll, we're, we're about to do an example. So this is do the steps. And if the Turing machine, well, I'll say, yeah, if the Turing machine ever arrives at an accepting state, the diagram, the state diagram will have accepting states and rejecting states in it. If the Turing machine ever arrives at an accepting state, we stop immediately and the string is accepted.
this is a little bit different from NFAs, DFAs. It's all about you read through the whole string and then you see where did I end up? Is it accepting or rejecting? This is not like that. Uh, that's because when the Turing machine is reading the string, actually the head, remember, is capable of moving to the right or to the left. So it, if it's going to move to the left, it, it doesn't even always make it to the end. So you don't, there's no such thing as being done reading the string because the head can move back and forth. Uh, anyway, if the Turing machine ever arrives at an accepting state, we stop and the string is accepted. Let's just try an example here. Baby's first Turing machine. So I'm going to give some names to these states. Usually we won't give them names, but just for the sake of talking about them, I'm going to have four states, S, T, Q, and R. And Q is the only accepting state. And uh, just like usual, we have a starting state. That's an arrow from nowhere pointing at the S. And the arrows here are labeled like this. So that arrow I labeled B slash B comma R. So if you see a label like X slash Y comma R, this means the head at this point should be reading X on the tape. Read X on the tape. Remember what the head does in each step. It reads the thing. It changes what's on the tape. So this means read X on the tape write X on the tape, and then move to the right. All right, so that R there, it, it can either be a R or an L. And the X and the Y are individual letters. Yeah? Do you mean write Y on the tape? Yes, thank you, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the first thing there is what you read, the second thing is what you write, and then you move either to the right or to the left. So when you see in this diagram BBR, that means if you're in state S, the head is looking at something on the tape. If it sees a B on the tape, it should change it to a B, which is to say leave it, leave it like it is, and then move to the right and switch into state T. All right, uh, so I'm going to fill in a bunch of other arrows here, and then we'll talk about what kinds of strings are accepted by this machine. So here I have a looping edge, AAR. Actually, this particular machine is fairly simple in that all of its moves are to the right. It never moves to the left. Uh, this one here on T, I have BBR. T going down to R, this is going to be a CCR. Uh, I have a diagonal S to R with a CCR. And then I have a loop here, CCR. An edge across blank, blank R. From S, I can do blank, blank, R also. And then there's a sort of big arrow from T, another diagonal, which I'll draw on the outside. T to Q, blank, blank, R. That's it. So this, this Turing machine is rather simple because it only moves to the right. And also, you'll notice it never changes what's on the tape, this, this thing. Uh, is always reading and writing the same thing in each step. So this is a, most Turing machines will be more complicated than this one, but we should start simple. And I would like to know which strings are accepted. And which are rejected. All right. Let's see if we can, so uh, let's just ask very specifically, how about is um, A, A, B, C accepted? And unfortunately, I can't keep this all on the screen at once. Is A, A, B, C accepted? I have, by the way, did I mention? I have found the final solution to my problem with the uh, the messy writing on my screen. I have decided it is because of my iPad overheats. If I take it out of this cute case and put it on the table, everything gets better. I think the case is like, holds the heat in. All right, anyway, is A, A, B, C accepted? This is what we gotta know. So uh, I'm gonna try to maybe scroll this out just so I don't have to, well, 
I'm going to have to scroll it away eventually. Anyway, let's try to see what happens step by step. I'm going to try and write out step by step what the, what the calculation looks like. So we begin, like I said before, the whole setup here is you begin with the input string written on the tape. So I'll write it like this way, A, A, B, C, with blanks on either side. Actually, those blanks to the left are never going to matter because this machine, remember I said, it only moves to the right. And the head begins here. And I'm going to put, just to remember, I'm going to, I'm going to write a little, a little S here inside this little hat. The head is uh, pointed there, and the head carries with it a state. And we begin in the starting state, which is S in this example. All right. And we just sort of see what happens step by step. So in the first step, we are in state S and we're reading an A. So what happens in state S when you read an A? You have to do this looped edge here. In state S, I read an A. What happens? You write A again. So that means this A will remain as an A. And then the head moves to the right by one position. So the next step looks like the same tape. Everything is the same on the tape, but the head has moved to the right by one position. It's now here and still in state S. The tape, uh, as part of Turing's definition, is that the tape is infinite in both directions. Um, I will, if I'm trying to draw the tape out, I'll usually just write a couple blanks on the end. Um, and in theory, the head could wander way off to the right. Uh, and I'll just add more blanks as needed in that case. Okay. What happens next? Well, we do a similar thing, actually. It's more or less the same thing, right? I'm in state S, and I'm looking at an A, which means from state S here, I see an A, which means I do this looped edge again, because that's the only edge with a read A on it. And so the A on the tape will remain an A, and then I'll move to the right by one position. So now it's like... A, A, B. It's looking at the B now, still in state S. Oops. All right. What next? Now something a little different happens. I'm in state S, but I read a B. So that's here in state S. I read a B. Uh, it says change it to a B. So it stays as a B and then move to the right. And move to state T. So that means the position of the head moves one to the right. So now it's looking at the C, but it's now in state T. All right. This is how we're doing. We're just going to keep going here and see what happens. I would say, I hope you're getting to, beginning to have an idea about what this machine is doing. When I look at this S with the AAR on it, my interpretation of that is when you're in state S, if you see A's, you just move past them to the right. So this, like this little loopy thing here, when I see that, what I think is you're just going to move to the right through any A's that you see. And then once you see a B, you move to the right once more, but now you switch into state T. And so all, all the rules change once you're in state T. All right? And what happens in state T? This BBR means if you see a B, you just keep on moving to the right. If you see a C, it says leave it as a C, move to the right, and switch to state R. So that, and that's what's going to happen right now, right? Because I see a C there. So now it's going to say blank, all right, A, A, B. See, I moved to the right, so I should be in state R now. I hope you don't mind one of the states is called R, and R is also the letter that we use for the right. That's not confusing. All right. What next? OK, I'm in now state R, and I see a blank. That means I'm going to follow this arrow, BBR, to state Q. And this is actually the end. So it's going to move to the right one more time. Leave the blank like it is. A, A, B, C, blank, blank. Now I'm here in state Q. 
And Q is an accepting state. Remember what uh, the general sort of setup that I said before. If the Turing machine ever enters an accepting state, you stop immediately and the string is accepted. So Q is accepting. So we stop and AABC is accepted. All right. If for some reason you never make it to the accepting state, like if, if the machine gets stuck uh, because there is no proper read instruction, then, uh, then the string is rejected. All right? This is how that works. A, A, B, C is accepted. When I look at, can we talk like about what kinds of strings are accepted here? Like I said, these loop things here, oops, these loops like this, this means when you begin, here's how I think of this. When you begin, any A's you see, you just move to the right past them. If you see a B, you go over here. Any more B's you see, you move to the right past them. And once you see a C, you go down here. Any more C's you see, you move to the right past them. And if you get to a blank, which is all the way on the end, then it should be accepted, all right? So based on that description, can anybody say what kinds of strings are accepted by this Turing machine? Yeah. Uh, they must. They should end in C. Yes, but that actually, there's more you can say about that. In order to actually get to Q, uh, let's ignore these other arrows for now. But to go around the square, um, you have to move past a bunch of A's and then move past a bunch of B's and then move through some C's and then get to the end. Right. So what what does the string look like? Does somebody else have an idea? You have an idea? I was gonna say all strings in general. Uh, it's not all strings in general. For instance, the string BA would not be accepted. Because if you start here, the first thing you see is B, you would go here. The head would move to the right now looking at A, but there is no read A from this state here. You got an idea? Yeah, I think I agree with this. She says this one accepts. A star, B star, C star. It has to be some number of A's first, and then you look at some B's, and then you look at some C's in that particular order, and then it can be accepted. Uh, you are not allowed to have something like B followed by A, because then the machine would get stuck in the middle. This accepts A star, B star, C star. These stars, remember, they can represent zero repetitions of one of those letters, and that's actually why these other arrows, this diagonal, so this diagonal would refer to a situation where you saw some A's, but there were no B's, but you did see some C's right after the A's. And then you would be able to go down here and see some more C's and then get accepted there, all right? Um, or uh, this long arrow here represents a situation when you saw some A's and then some B's, but no C's. You can jump straight to the end. All right, A star, B star, C star is correct. So this is something, you know, again, you have to kind of get used to uh, working with Turing machines. One bit of good news, I suppose, we're never actually going to draw the tape like this. There's a better way of writing this so that you don't have to keep on doing this thing. I hope that this made sense. It's just a pain to write in big, uh, big strips of tape like that. So we're going to write this. We write it like so. This way of writing is actually kind of confusing if you, uh, if you don't think about it carefully, which is why I wrote it out in that somewhat weird way to begin with. Um, we are going to write the state right inside what's on the tape. So anyway, uh, the, first, the very first one said uh, a bunch of blanks with A, A, B, C in the middle. And the head is at this first A in state S. The way I'm going to represent that situation is like this. S, A, A, B, C. So when you see that S, that is one of the states. And this means that the head is in state S. So my interpretation of this is the head is in state S, big S, and it's pointed at a, like this A right there. 
So you, you draw the letter for representing the, the state of the head right before the letter that it's actually pointed to on the table, all right? And then what was the next step? The next step was still in state S, if I look in this way. We're still in state S, but now we moved over by one position, so that would be written like, and actually, I'm gonna use that style of arrow, like this. So this now means the head, the head is still in state S, but it moved to the right by one position. And then after that, it does the same thing, moves to the right by one position again. So now it says AASBC, but staying in the same state. And now when I see SB, that means the head is in state S, but reading a letter B. So on the diagram, I would be looking at, at this, this here, reading a letter B is here, so it should move to the right by one, keep that as a B, and switch to state T. So this becomes AABTC like that. The head moved one position to the right and it's now in state T. And now it's pointing at a C on the tape. Uh, when it points at the C, it should move to the right again and switch into state R. That will look like A, A, B, C, R, blank. So I, I usually don't write the blanks. All of these strings, you can imagine that they have infinitely many blanks on either end. I'm, all, I'm only going to write the blank when it actually matters. So here, the head is in state R, and it's looking at a blank. So I'm actually going to write the blank at that point. All right. And what happens when we're in state R and we see a blank? It says move to the right again. So actually, now it looks like A, B, C, blank, blank, Q, blank, I guess. There's another blank. And Q is accepting, and so this is accepted because Q is an accepting state. So this is the way that we're going to write our Turing machine step by step. We will never again draw a big long tape thing. All right. Did I write too many blanks there? I think I did. I'm trying to say this R goes here and turns into a Q. That, I put an extra blank, sorry. It should be like that. It moved to the right one spot and turned into a Q. And there's another blank on the end now, so I put that, that blank. Just because I don't like to write the state of the head but not pointing at anything. All right, this is how we write dim down. All right, let's try, would you mind a few more simple examples? We still got 20 minutes here. I got two more simple examples and then I got one for you all to try. And we'll see. How we do? Uh, how about here's a you know standard kind of a homework problem. Let's make a Turing machine for this here language. How about A X, where X is in A B star? In other words, this is all strings which start with A. I want a Turing machine which accepts if the string starts with A, and otherwise it is rejected. All right, this one is actually very easy. Remember the way that the Turing machine works is, as soon as you enter an accepting state, the whole thing stops and it's accepted. So all I gotta do is make it so that you read the first letter. If it's an A, you go to an accepting state, and that's it, right? If it's not an A, I want it to be rejected, but in that case, I can just not put any arrows, and it will automatically get stuck and be rejected. So actually, this requires only one, well, only two states, I guess. One is the starting state, and the other is the accepting state. And what determines if you're accepted is just if it starts with A. So I'm going to put AAR, meaning if you see A as the first letter, keep it as an A, and then move to the right by one position. Although it actually doesn't matter if you keep it as an A or not. It also doesn't matter if you move to the right or to the left. But then you go to the accepting state. So when I start, if I see an A, I go to the accepting state, and that means the string is accepted. What if I don't see a B first? I'm, what if I don't see an A first? If it was a B first, then uh, I would have nothing to do, and it would get stuck, which means the string, the string is rejected. All right. So if I were to say, let's just test them out. A, B, B, what would that look like? Uh, it's 
maybe I'll give names to them for the purpose of writing down the derivation. I start with S, A, B, B. The S sees the A, keeps it as the A moves to the right by one position, and becomes A, T, B, B, and this is accepted because T is an accepting state. But instead, if I was looking at something like B, A, B, I would start S, B, A, B, but now this immediately gets stuck because there is no arrow in the machine that says read B, whatever, whatever, all right? So this is stuck, which means rejected. Looks like rejeated, what I wrote there. All right, if the machine gets stuck because there's no appropriate arrow, the string is rejeated. Any thoughts about that? This was a very simple one. Let's try one that's a little more fancy, a little more interesting perhaps. How about um, I want a Turing machine for this language, BXB. So this will be similar. It has to start with a B, but this one, it has to also end with a B. And X, of course, is in AB star. All right. BXB. OK, so the B on the front is actually easy to handle. We do it in very, in very much the same way that we did the, uh, the, the first example. So uh, I would just say something like start by reading a B, and if not, get stuck. Right? So my, my basic, at least the beginnings of it, will look like this. Right? This is my starting state. In order to proceed at all, you have to start with a B, right? And if it starts with an A, then you just immediately get stuck. There will be no other arrows from the first state, all right? This is to get the start. Now, what about the B at the end? This is a little bit more tricky of how to handle. The basic idea is you want to go all the way to the end, um, and then if you see a B as the last letter, then that should be accepted. And if, the, if it's uh, A is the last letter, it should be rejected. So the way to go all the way to the end, I would say, if I were to write in words what I'm doing here, start by reading a B, and if not, you get stuck. Then go to the right all the way to the last letter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then if it's B, accept, right? So we need to move the head all the way to the right until you see the last letter. Um, the way I would do that is something like a loop here. Keep on going over and over again, moving to the right. If you see an A, keep it as an A and move to the right. And if I see a B, keep it as a B and move to the right. This is actually a very common sort of pattern that you will use in your Turing machines. When you see something like this, this is kind of what you do to mean something like move to the right all the way. Because this goes to the right continually through every A and also through every B. It moves all the way to the end, all right? Uh, the problem with this is, this is a little tricky because I said what I want to do is go all the way to the right until the last letter. But if you think about it just because of the way the head works, the head has no way of knowing if it's at the last letter. It just goes one letter at a time, and when it sees each letter, it doesn't know this is the last one. It just, um, really, the only way to move all the way to the end is to go all the way, overshoot the end and see a blank, and then move back by one position. So this is a little technicality, but this is also something that you're gonna do all the time in your examples. So it looks, oops. I'm gonna put, it's a shame the tour isn't walking by when I say this. Put on that BBL. This means you go all the way to the end. You have to overshoot the end, though, just because of the way the Turing machine works. It, it's not capable of telling when it gets to the last letter. So when you see a blank, it means you went one step too far, and you should move back to the left by one. All right? I've been teaching this course for several years. There was a time when I, when I first taught this course, 
nobody had heard of the BBL. Now everybody's heard of the BBL. The new, uh, new joke that I was able to work in over the years. All right. So this, this is, again, something that's very common that we're going to do all the time. You move to the right all the way until you go past the end, and then you back it up by one position. This is the only way that you can look specifically at the last letter. All right? So you move all the way, then back up once. That's really what sort of all of this is doing. All right? You have to back up once in order to be pointing at the final letter. So now, at this point, we are looking at the last actual letter in the string, not a blank. And if it's a B, it should be accepted. So that just looks like this. That R right there doesn't actually matter. If you'd like, you could put the little b, b, l, little b, little b, l, if you want. But that doesn't matter. That just means in the last position, so my little commentary here, if the last letter is B, then accept. That's how it works. All right. Anybody got questions about that? I got one for you all to try. It's sort of a variation on this basic idea. So let's try this. How about A, B, X, C, Y, A, where X and Y are in A, B, C star. So this one has C's in it also. Doesn't make much of a difference. Sorry, the X, this, this is much harder than what I meant. I meant to say X and Y are in A, B, not C. With the C in there is far more difficult. You should be able to do the same basic idea as what we just did.
All right, it looks like folks are doing great with this one. Let's just try this out. So to get, um, to start with A, it must have this, like AAR. And then next I want to see B, so I'll put BBR here. And then now I have to move through the X. So it needs to repeatedly move to the right, which looks like this, AAR, BBR. X doesn't have any C's in it, so I'm just gonna stick with A's and B's. That will move me all the way through the X. The next thing I see will be a C, and I wanna move through the C, so I'll go CCR. Next, I have Y, which is another string of A's and B's, and so I need loops to move myself through the Y. So I'll do another one of these guys, AAR, BBR. And once I do that, I want to see A at the end, but actually these loops will move me through this A also. And so when you do these loops, you'll, out, you'll actually move, run all the way to the end, which means next thing you see will be a blank. I have to back it up by one position and verify that the last letter really was an A. So it's like that. I hope this is what you said. This is what most people were saying as I walked around. That's how we do it. Anybody got any questions about that one? Thoughts? All right. Um, I have another example, but it's quite a bit more complicated. I thought maybe we'll just start off next time with, uh, with my new example. My next example is going to be, um, you can tell this is going to be more complicated. A to the N, B to the N, which is uh, not even a regular language. Um, not so hard to do, but it's a little tricky. We'll start it off next time with that.